כל ה... כל ה... כל ה... קאם צ'קס! 1, 2, 3, 4, ו... יש עוד אחד עוד אחד. אבל אין לי שורט קאט לזה, למה אין לי שורט קאט לזה? אין לי שורט קאט לזה. 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 Uh, I should probably put a shortcut for that one somewhere. Maybe, 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 maybe. Maybe I can do... Maybe I can do a double, a double press. Hotkeys. Far side, switch to scene. What's this button do? Uh, that's a multiple way. Or is that like double press? Double press, so if I do like that one and that one, does that mean that I have to press it both twice or uh, it doesn't work? Okay. Okay, never mind. I need to come up with a new shortcut key for that one. CC. Okay. So guys, how's it going? Cheeky, cheeky impromptu, impromptu stream. Wasn't planning on doing a stream, but got some spare time this evening. Got a couple of little things to look at, so I thought I would jump on the old YouTube and uh, take you guys along for the for the ride. It is Friday, I think. Yeah, is it Friday? Fuck man, I don't know. Lose track of days and shit. Is it Friday today? Uh, yes, it is Friday. Awesome. Happy Friday. Hope your week's been good. Hope you have had a, a successful week. Hope you've been good at what you've been doing. Welcome to the stream. Welcome to the stream, guys. Welcome to Ernard. Welcome to Can't Afford Jail. Welcome to Ryan. How's it going, Ryan? What's up, Blake? Hey, my man. First one in the chat. Jason, how's it going? Hawaiian Amps Repair. Aloha Sam, Hawaii. Aloha to you, my friend. Long way that you're watching this from. How's things in Hawaii? Is it is it just like it looks like in the holiday brochure? With all that like golden air, sandy beaches, beautiful sunshine, clear ass waters, like hay, like straw huts and shit. Because it looks beautiful and shit. Um, how's it going, Peter? How's it going, man? How's it going, Chris? How's it going, Elliot? Promo? Fusion? Thanks for jumping on the stream. Uh, just while we uh, start the stream, just as kind of like an appetizer, what I'm just sort of working on now, what I, what I was working on this evening, which um, I thought might be cool to show some of you guys. Let's just move that over there a little bit. What have we got over here? Maybe that one goes in there. So the thing that I'm working on this evening is I'm working on uh, these little... These little tiny little micro amplifiers, uh, these are pretty cool. So what this is, this is a tiny little amplifier unit that uh, you can hide behind your dashboard, for example, or in your glove compartment or somewhere really inconspicuous and out of the way. And it plugs into your vehicle's um, factory wiring harness. You see you've got the um, plug, adapters, uh, pl plug adapters here, I think they're the ISOs or whatever they call them. So, yeah, you can basically plug this amplifier in line with your factory head unit, I guess, and achieve higher output um, than your head unit. I think this is this is labeled as a 65.4, so I assume that's going to give you 65 watts RMS times 4, um, probably into 2 ohms, it's probably a bit less at 4 ohms, unless they've calibrated it for, for 4 ohms, which is pretty cool. Very, very basic adjustments on this, you've just got... Um, you just got your gain for front and rear and you just got full or high pass and you've got no adjustment for the high pass frequency it's fixed I couldn't tell you 
what um, frequency it's fixed at, but yeah, it is a fixed um, high pass filter, which is fine. It's just, it's just there to take the bass out of your factory door speakers. So if you're running a sub, you can turn your door speakers up louder before they start distorting, which is pretty nice. So yeah, I'm actually a big fan of this. Um, a lot of people, that's that's all you'd need really for your front stage. You know, if in your day in your daily driver, you don't need a shit ton of power. You're only running a single six and a half and tweet or something like that. Maybe even your factory speakers because they sound a lot better when they're amped up. So I'm quite quite a big fan of these. Um, now I've actually been working my way through some of these this evening. Um, this is the fourth one I've repaired. So this is number four. This is number three. This is number two. And this is number one. So just to give you an idea what sort of faults these things can have, this first one wouldn't wouldn't turn on, and it wouldn't turn on because of a faulty um, transistor as part of the remote turn on circuit. So you, you applied the remote to the amplifier, nothing happened. Found a faulty transistor that was preventing the signal for the remote passing onto the uh, TL494 and the VCC circuit. So replace that transistor. That one worked fine. This second one uh, had a bad factory solder joint on the supply voltage, uh, the, the voltage supply circuit for the output drivers. So as a result, the amplifier turned on, but had no output whatsoever. So um, it took a little, little uh, a few minutes to track down that that was the issue. Uh, I had to, basically this is the first time I've looked at these like today. I have never seen this circuit before today. You don't have a schematic either, um, but I just cracked it open, had a look at what drivers it was using, had a look at where the supply voltage was, saw that it wasn't present, uh, traced, it, traced its way back to a, a resistor, a little surface mount resistor that had poor solder didn't, didn't actually wasn't actually making a connection from factory reflowed that solder joint that one now works um, this one here had uh, this one here as a really interesting fault had bad um, inductors on the preamp section so basically with the RCAs they go in here okay and before they reach the um, op amps on the preamp circuit they pass through a couple of filters they pass through a surface mount capacitor which acts like a low pass uh, no, sorry, acts like a high pass filter, sorry, blocking DC. So yeah, it passes through a little capacitor in series, and then it also passes through uh, a tiny little surface mount dual inductor. It's really tiny ass little thing. I had to use my microscope to actually see what I was doing. Tiny little thing. And um, this one had all four of the inductor coils were severely damaged and shorting the signal to ground and all over the place. So um, they're actually just kind of like, I don't have any of those spare inductors uh, on hand and I've no idea what value they are and stuff like that. So I just bridged over them. I just took them out of the circuit entirely and just jumped over over the traces and it doesn't exhibit any more noise than the ones with inductors so um, I think it's just for a little bit noise filtration you know just for just just in case kind of vibes you know they just put it in the circuit just in case um, and this one didn't actually exhibit a fault at all um, this one seemed to work fine now this is the fifth one this is the last one that we're gonna be looking at and um, yeah I'll take you guys through the process this one says won't turn on so I assume it might have a similar uh, issue with the remote turn on circuit so we're going to check that out and uh, see what that is. This is the last one that I'm repairing this evening um, of, of these. And once we've done this, we will turn our attention to a nice old school Alpine V12 um, two channel. Great big thing. Uh, I've repaired quite a few of those in the past, so I know my way around the circuit a little bit. <laughs> Hawaiian Amp says, only rainbows and butterflies. So it is like the brochure then. <laughs> Yeah, the cute little things. You, you wait till you see the circuit. It's pretty cute in there. You, I'll, I'll show you guys what they're using in, in these. Pretty cool. Um, yes, yeah, so it's about. It's a little, little bigger. Actually, it's probably about the similar size to to a, um, a banknote. Yeah, like a dollar note or like a, in the UK, it's probably a fifty pound note. Um, I use a baby Pioneer monoblock. Sounds great with a Sundown SFB, huh? Wait. Oh, Pioneer Block, oh, okay, like a four channel, yeah, for sure. That's a, that's a really nice little compact, efficient system, isn't it? The uh, SFB 1000 and um, and the little Pioneer Block. But I'm a little bit disappointed you went for the, the Sundown Full Bridge. I would, I'd rather have seen you put your money into um, the original designers of that circuit or, or one of the other Brazilian brands that actually sort of are doing that thing rather than the Chinese factory. Okay, so yeah, just uh, it's just a few screws. We, all we need is we need four screws out of this one, and then this just kind of comes out like this. You can see the cramp in there, and then you just have to unscrew the screw on the fuse block, and then these differ in how hard they are to push out. 
Um, sometimes they come out really easy. I like this one. This one's coming out really easy. Some of them are real hard. Now there's actually a really, really poor design oversight. Are you ready for some absolute bullshit, absolute factory nonsense, right? This, this is the most embarrassing oversight that I've seen in quite a long time from a factory, okay? So naturally, this is a tiny little amplifier and it needs to dissipate some heat, okay? So if we look, take a look down inside the amplifier here, you can see there that we've got a little heat spreader, okay? And the heat spreader is underneath these outputs here. The, the, just, just these tiny little chips here, which are, which are doing the work. They are two times, I think they're, what is it? Two times 65 watts or something each. Okay, now, so on the base of the PCB under the trace, they'll be dissipating their heat via this heat spreader, which is then supposed to be connected to the heat sink, except it doesn't because there's a fucking gap there. So you see, they've, they've lathered this with thermal paste with the intention of that making contact with the heat sink, except of course it doesn't because <laughs> because it fucking didn't make it thick enough. So it just doesn't even touch the heat sink. So literally when you're running this thing, the heat spreader, this this heat spreader has nowhere to, to dissipate its heat. So like, I, I think that this ended up being a non-issue because these things are so efficient and tiny that un unless you're absolutely abusing the crap out of them, they're not really gonna get hot enough for this to matter. But if you were abusing this, or if you were running it like hard on its limits, you know, for a long time, especially in the summer, with this heat spreader not making a connection to the heat sink, all of the heat is completely trapped inside this unit. It has nowhere to go. There's no fan, there's no air movement, there's no air circulation. The only way for the heat to get out is by con um, convection through the air inside itself to the heat sink, which is very, very slow and very inefficient. There's no direct contact between anything that creates heat in this amp and the case. Um, so that's the outputs. Uh, the same thing with the power supply section. The power supply section is, is compromised, consists of these two power supply MOSFETs, just one push, one pull. They are on their own little heat sinks, but again, you, you're just encased in this, like there's nowhere for the heat to go. Um, I understand that they didn't put a little fan in here because it might be, the, the fan would have to be so small that it would whine. It would be like, Wee! little little PC little fan like that. Um, and so it'd be quite annoying. You might be able to hear it and stuff, which I, which I understand, but, it would have been nice if they could have just moved, like literally all they needed to do, which they did actually do, right? This is the thing that gets me. In, they, they make a monoblock version of this. This is the four channel. They make a mono version of this. Um, and in the mono version, they got it right. In the mono version, all of the MOSFETs are clamped to a heat sink that is then like a heat spreader, which is then screwed, clamped onto the this this case but via some, some sort of bolts in the side here that kind of pull it to the heat sink. To, to the heat spreader here. So they put the power supply MOSFETs and everything along the edge or along the middle or whatever it is, can't remember. But in this one, all they needed to do was just put this MOSFET on the edge here, put this MOSFET on the edge here with a heat spreader that then touches their side, which you can screw into from the side. And then they just needed to make this a little bit thicker so that it actually touches the case. That's literally all they needed to do. <laughs> Uh, are those repairs worth it? Uh, uh, you see, I'm, I'm a bit biased because I think <laughs> I think all repairs are worth it. I hate throwing stuff away. Like to me, um, th like these these boards, they're so small, and any issues they're going to have are generally pretty minor. So it, if I can just replace a couple of parts and somebody gets enjoyment out of this piece of kit again, then then that's worth it to me. In terms of cost, like for my time, I'm I'm probably not charging anywhere near enough um, for my time on these things for what they are like for how much I'm charging. Like I'll be I'll just be charging peanuts for this kind of thing, um, and so time wise, it's probably not like super worth it. Like I'm probably not making much money at all like for my time, but I kind of enjoy getting these things up and running again. You know, there's a, there's a little bit of a balance there. Uh, if you enjoy your work, then you're more willing to kind of take a hit on um, on uh, some of the costs and whatnot if, if you actually enjoy it so look if we, if we check out this right i'm just gonna put a little bit of cardboard here so in the one that had the preamp issues the uh the tiny inductors that i was talking about if you're interested zoom in right over here so we have why oh, is it zoomed in too much come on i'm sure you can focus on that no you can't focus that close sheesh all right there we go 
so yeah this is the preamp um, section so on the one that had the preamp fault um, with the inductors these things are the dual inductors they're absolutely tiny so you got the RCA signal comes in here for like um, left channel and here for right channel and then you have the signal for right channel goes through this inductor pin and out this side and then the ground for that one is this side so this has four pins one two three four so that's signal and that's ground for these two here and then for these two here for the right hand side you have this inductor here we have signal going in there and ground coming back around there i think uh, and then it goes then it goes through this capacitor here in series uh, as like a little bit of a high pass filter to prevent DC offset from damaging stuff before going making its way to the op amps for high pass filter and gain. Um, so yeah, the, the, in the one that had the preamp faults, these inductors were all janked up inside. They were proper, you know, they were all shorting out against each other and and all kinds of shit like that. So. Uh, replacing those inductors just with some little bits of wire because I don't have those inductors in stock and you know it's not worth waiting or ordering parts for these They're, it sounds fine without them so there's, there's no noticeable increase in noise or anything like that without them so anyway start attention to, to what the fault with this what with this specific one is then this one says it doesn't turn on no power so what we're going to do is we're actually going to take our power wire for this and plug it in and see where the voltages are missing to get this thing powered up so I just need to clip our power wires in there, make sure that my power supply wires haven't come out of the little ISO block over here. Don't think they have. Cool, cool. Turn on the scope. Turn on the power supply. Okay. So what is the problem? What is problem? Let's turn our attention to this part of the circuit because this is where the power supply and the remote turn on circuit, etc., resides. To be honest, guys, I've been, I've been thinking like, I've been thinking to try and improve my stream quality. So, this camera that you're looking at now, it's, uh, it's one of those old JVC um, handycam things, I don't know, handycam or like Inverio like camcorder. Uh, I've just got it idling, just running through a capture card. Uh, I'm just trying to work out how to get better clarity on the screen. So when I look at the actual screen of the camera itself, it looks pretty clear, but it's a little blurry, isn't it? Like, you can't make out these values here. Um, it's like not the most clear picture, is it, to be honest? So I'm wondering whether that's my capture card. If I stuck a different capture card in, that might improve things. Um, or just got a like a really high quality kind of like zoomy camera that was USB or something. Because... Um, this is the camera that you're probably looking at most. Um, this one where you're looking at my face, it's a cheapo webcam, but I don't feel like you need like super high clarity for that. It's just kind of like chatting vibes. But um, I do have a DSLR that I could put here instead. Um, and then of course you've got uh, this one, which is the scope cam. I don't feel like you need any super high quality camera for this one. All you're doing is looking at the scope screen and this does uh, this job just fine. It's a small compact camera. I don't feel like I need to upgrade that one. Um, the camera on top of my head, I could definitely upgrade this one. Like if this was a nice high clarity camera, see how this looks all really kind of like, um, uh, it's, it's not, it's kind of blurry, but it's kind of like low res. It's like low bit rate. The bit rate is really low, isn't it? Like if that was a higher bit rate, that would probably look a lot nicer. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll try a better quality capture card. Uh, the only problem with capture cards is they have a delay. They delay the uh, the video signal, um, so I'd have to add delays to my microphone, to all the other cameras, and it's just kind of annoying. Anyway, so with this amplifier, then let's have a look. So we should have uh, 12 volts on this pass by MOSFET, uh, which don't seem to. Maybe is that because my wires come out? Yeah, wires come out. Okay, so we should have yeah 12 volts on this uh, two power supply MOSFETs, which we do. We should have uh, ground on leg three, which we don't. Okay, so there's no ground at the moment connected. Just put some wires fell out again. So, like I said, 12 volts, ground. Yep, that's ground on there, nothing moves, that's fine. And now the remote. So we've got ground, we've got power and ground. The remote comes in and is part of this circuit down here. So. What we're looking for is we need to make sure that we have 12 volts sitting on the leg of this transistor here, 
which we do. 12 volts need to be also be sitting on the leg of this transistor here. Ah, that's not. So this is actually the same issue as the first one I looked at. So we're supposed to have 12 volts here and here. Then when we apply the remote, this 12 volts, I think it is, gets pulled down to ground and that activates this transistor to have 12 volts on it, which then ties to pin 12 of the TL494 to turn the TL494 chip on, which is just here. So the fact that this doesn't have 12 volts on this leg and this leg means that this transistor is probably dead. Yep, so that's just a really basic, simple, it's a PNP, it's a, it's a 40 volt PNP. Um, so we're just gonna go ahead and swap that out and that should save the day for this little one. And so like I say, are these repairs worth it? Like, if all I've gotta do is change out this tiny little SOT23 transistor, and somebody gets to enjoy this amp again, and it actually plays music, then that, I'm cool with that, you know? So replace it with a 2T, which is the same, same specification as the original. The original transistor has a marking 2L. This one here is a 2T, which does have the same basic parameters. It's not critical what transistor you use here, it's just it's like logic level really. Have you heard of the ta Tagano cameras that EV Blog use? No, I haven't. Um, I'll look them up, but if I'm perfectly honest, my streams are like, you know, they're, they're alright. Um, kind of, they're, they're visually, they're like medium. They're not like super bad quality, but they're not like mega high quality. But I don't feel like it would be worth spending like hundreds and hundreds of pounds on super high resolution cameras. I, w I don't feel like it would add that much more value to the streams. Um, Having, having those really expensive cameras. So, um, if, if, I can sp if I can do it like cheaper, if I can get better quality cameras but not spend a bunch of money, then yeah. Anonymous Repair, how's it going man? Good evening to you. So hopefully this will just get it working really nice and quick and I can show you um, the rest of the circuit. There we go, that is a nice solder connection that one. Okay, so now if I turn the power supply back on, uh, I'm not going to turn the amplifier back on just yet, I'm just going to turn the power supply on just to see if the voltages are now present where they should be. Hit the power supply. So we didn't have 12 volts on this pin before, so let's see, do we have 12 volts there now? Yeah, yeah we do. So now if I turn the amplifier on, we should see uh, PWM on the this MOSFET here. So I'll need to just change my scope settings to in order to see that. 
Ta da! There you go. There's PWM. It's amplified now. Works. So now, to, in, in order to make sure the output section works, let's turn our attention to the output section just to show you what that looks like on this one. So they're pretty cool. So the output section of this one simply consists of a couple of uh, fully integrated Class D two-channel um, ICs. So these I these these chips are like fully integrated two-channel Class D amplifiers. They're pretty crazy. All you need to do is uh, feed them with rail voltage, VCC voltage, um, you know, an output, um, some some parameters for the switching frequency, um, audio signal input, like uh, enable uh, logic and stuff like that. And yeah, they'll they'll they're, they're, they are in the in and amongst themselves complete class D amplifiers. Um, you don't need to do anything else. All you need to do is just you just need to add a filter circuit, so inductors. So we've got four inductors here, one for each channel. One, two, three, four, uh, and then some filter capacitors here. Yeah, that's pretty much it. And obviously a preamp circuit. Um, you don't need the preamp circuit. You can you can just kind of use a, a, a op amp as a buffer um, before the chip if you didn't want any filters or anything like that. But yeah, pretty cool little thing. Um, so in order to see the switch PWM, um, there's four locations on the board that we can test. There's one there by this capacitor, two, and this capacitor is acting as a bootstrap for the high side um, supply. And that one there, and that one there. So if we turn it on and just make sure this is switching on the output section. Ta-da! There it is. So it's a little bit noisy, as you can see, a little bit ringy. But um, yeah, that's working fine. That chip is active. We have a 0.4 amps worth of idle current draw, which uh, matches up with the rest of the amplifiers I'm looking at. Switching frequency is actually pretty high. Is it 440 kilohertz on the switching frequency, which is actually higher than some of your more, what you would call premium grade class D uh, multi-channel full range amplifiers, uh, car amplifiers. So a, a pretty reasonable high speed switching frequency there. Um, so, you know, especially with um, cheap door speakers or factory door speakers or like speakers in factory locations, it's gonna sound absolutely fine. Um, yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna be fine for, for, for your daily drive, for what you need, it's gonna be nice and loud. So that's that one fixed. So I'm just going to put that back in its case and we're going to look at an Alpine. Hello from NC. How's it going, Daniel? Technical specialist. I'm just about to start sinking the largest floodgate structure down using our automation control system. And that sounds, that sounds hecking exciting. Sounds like a, a kid's dream kind of thing, you know, like it's like a proper massive game but in real life. It sounds intense. Hope that goes all right. Get an old Sony Mavica camera. Use the camera from it. Mavica. They use the floppy drive, good optics, and macro zoom. They should cost close to nothing. What is their output? Are they uh, are they USB? Let's let's have a quick uh, a Google of what that is. Just out of interest. What is that Sony? Ma. So how would I use that on the live stream though? Yeah, cool. That's all sorted then. I just put it back in the heatsink, and uh, yeah, that, that's the last one of these. That's the little power supply transformers. Yeah, you got two MOSFETs here. So yeah, you got your power comes in. So I'll, I'll just talk you through this circuit just because it's fun, it's a cute little thing. Power comes in through the fuse. You've then got two power supply MOSFETs push pull for the transformer. TL494, very basic um, standard power supply circuit um, on the um, on these. Tiny little baby transformer, which probably could be optimized with the switching frequency, which I haven't done. You've got your two rectifiers over here, which are way bigger than needed, but 
there you go. Um, you've got your power supply filter capacitor, you've got your rail caps, um, and then you've got the um, VCC supply for the um, driver, for the, the actual, driver, the actual um, amplifier chips itself, is over here uh, using this little SOT89 package component there. Um, you've got your two class D two channel uh, outputs there and you've got your preamp circuit with a couple of uh, TL074Cs there just dealing with the gain and the high pass filter your four inductors for filtering the wave before it gets to the speaker terminals uh, what else a couple of little film caps for extra filtration but that's pretty much it I think over here on this side of the board I'm pretty sure that's going to be your plus minus nine volts for the uh, power to the preamplifier op amps I think that's what that's going to be um, yeah pretty sure that's what that is but yeah yeah all in all a cute little thing if only they hadn't done the done the big oops and uh, not made this heat spreader thick enough so that it actually touches the heatsink so what I've been doing with the the other ones I've prepared is I've actually managed to find for the other ones um, I've got a little metal heat spreader. I've got little, little, little metal heat spreaders that um, have come from other amplifiers. And they just happen to be the perfect thickness to marry up with the heat sink. I'm just going to see if I've got any of these left. Ah, hang on. That will do. Wherever that is. It's only small, but it will help. The other ones I fitted were bigger, but it's better than nothing. That will transfer some heat directly to the uh, to the heat sink. I've also got some bits of copper here, but they're not quite thick enough. I found. Yeah, I think that that's the best we've got. That's that's just the right thickness as well. These little thermal pads. So just going to do is whack some thermal paste on the heat spreader, like so, just a little bit there, and then shimmy her down, spread that out a little bit, it feels a bit crunchy actually, I don't want to, there we go. Yeah, just like that, and then a bit more thermal paste on the front of this, like so. I'm just going to spread it out a little bit because it does all it does all ooze up because it's a, it's a very tight fit against the heat sink, which is what you want. So it does all kind of ooze up a little bit against the edge. So it's going to spread it out a little bit just to get nice good coverage onto the heat sink. Like, to be honest, I think these things have been running fine um, without any contact to the heat, to the heat sink, but like, it makes me feel uncomfortable. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it some contact. So then, that slides back in here, like so. And we just need to make sure that that goes in there and stays down. seems to be a tighter squeeze than the others the others did kind of go in a lot easier than this okay there we go there it is oh this one's a heckin tight squeeze you can see all of the uh, thermal paste there that's like squished out all over my fingers which is wonderful absolutely love it they love to see it so we just need to push this down again and Make sure it stays in place. And 
and there we go. Now it has proper, well, somewhat contact, thermal contact to the heat sink, to the, uh, the actual amplifier case, which is going to help it keep cool and run a little bit more reliable. Oh man, thermal paste, that shit gets everywhere, bruv, I'm telling you. Oh man, thanks very much to uh, DLF for the 35, um, I think, what's Zaha? Hey from South Africa, what does is, what is the ZAR stand for? Start of interest. Do you ever repair head units or only amps? I have a head unit that has the remote amp switch wire, it's only half voltage, does not switch my amps on. I don't. I'm. I i do not repair head units. No, it's not. I, I find them f way too fiddly to take apart. Um, and then once you do get inside head units, they're more like a computer motherboard. It's all. It's all data, and it's all like super low, low voltage, logic level stuff. Um, tiny, tiny surface mount components. Way smaller than you find in amplifiers. Um, yeah, it's just not really something that. Like a lot of the time, head units, like the sorts of head units that people will inquire about that have issues will generally be pretty cheap stuff, like that you could, you could just buy a replacement for not that much more money than what it would end up costing to repair it, so. Zuid Afrikanase Rand. Oh, cool. Thanks for that. And then I'm just going to tell the guy that this one I have added thermals to. So they, they got the guy who this is for is for a, a, a dealer. Um, if he's choosing which one to put in a customer's vehicle, if he thinks the customer's going to be running it hard, or if he's got a two ohm load to drive, then he, he'll know to maybe pick one of the ones that has contact to heat sink. Um, so let's go for size, make it smaller, because it'll look better. And then print. little sticker on the front that just says thermal to case just so that he knows that this is one of the ones that I have made thermal contact to the case with there we go and did I do it with this one as well yeah I think I did Michael says, did you go to school for this type of work? No, like um, when, I, when I started at repairing amplifiers, I think it was like, how many years ago was it now? Um, I wanna say five years ago maybe? Um, yeah, when I started about five years ago, I didn't have a clue what any electronic components were. I didn't, I, I, I knew less than probably all of you. Didn't know what a MOSFET was, what it did. I didn't know anything about diodes or anything like that. Um, but I was really, I, I was distributing car audio and I had a bunch of amplifiers that came back um, that, that were faulty from factory and I either had to ship them back off to Brazil at my own expense or just learn to repair them. So I just learned to repair them and enjoyed it. So then that became a thing. But I, I learned mostly through Perry's Guide. Um, Perry's Guide and a couple of good friends um, who were electronics technicians that kind of helped me out a little bit when I got stuck. Ah. 
Right, so let's put all these back to one side then and let's grab the next big amplifier to look at, which is going to be uh, Alpine. Alpine old school two channel thing. So let's put all these wires away. All these uh, ISO looms and shit on the bench now. It's proper long, really long these. This is the main, the main event for this evening. This is a lovely old amplifier. This is an Alpine MRV 1507. I've repaired quite a few of these over the years. Um, they're lovely, lovely pieces of kit. I think they are MOSFET Final um, Class ABs. Um, and there's a bit of speculation as to whether MOSFET Final sounds all right or not some people say that mosfet final class ab just sounds a bit empty or a bit harsh um i personally haven't noticed that myself but um yeah some people are not a huge fan of these things uh, in terms of how they sound but i think they sound great uh, they're very powerful um they're a great piece of uh car audio history great piece of alpine audio engineering So let's see what's up with it. Why is it in the workshop? DC straight and MOSFET final. We have some nice graphs on the front here for the response curves for each of the settings. For the EQ settings and the Q factors, which is pretty cool to see. Helps you to understand and decide what settings to have on here. Take a look inside, see what the condition of this one's like. Do, 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 do. What happened to the T line door pods you made? Um, I think they're 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 in the car. They're they're playing. They sound amazing. Um, I think probably this year I'll do a I'll do a really I'll I'll, I'll take my time and I'll make a really nice um, kind of like showcase video for the Proton. The subwoofer installed in the back isn't finished at all and probably won't be finished by the time I make the video because it's one of those things where I have desires for what I want for the subwoofer setup in in the Proton, but. The Proton is an SQ car, like it's not a loud baser, and I don't want it to be a loud baser. I don't want to ruin ruin the uh, welds. I don't want to rip the doors. Like it's it's not a very well built car. It's a cheap Malaysian budget car, and um, it, it falls to pieces if you shake it. Like I had genuine metal fatigue from simply running, you know, my Pioneers and my um, Audio System Xeons back in the day. Um, so I don't want to throw anything crazy big in there. And because it's an SQ car, I've actually started to dislike really, really bass heavy. Like, so if I'm listening to my music, I actually turn the subs down to match with the level of the music so it sounds nice and so I can still hear the music, right? So I don't need anything crazy in the Proton. And I've got a little temporary sub set up in there at the moment. I've got like a little 12 inch prototype sub that some company sent me in a L ported box on an Alpine MR VM500. Like a little 500 watt thing. It sounds fine. It's more than I need for, for daily driving. So I'm in that difficult point where I would love a big infinite baffle setup, a true IB install in the, in the back with the, with the hole cut out of the boot floor and like a big, a big 32 inch or something ridiculous like just absolutely ridiculous in there but um i'm quite content with how it sounds so i don't have a lot of motivation to get that done you know if you know what i mean um but yeah the, the front stage sounds glorious um so yeah I'll, I'll probably make a showcase video of the proton this summer when the weather's nice i'll give it a good old wash and you know get some nice video footage of it i have a drone now i've got i've got some really cool cameras i've got an insta 360 camera i've got a, a drone um and uh, i've got the dji mavic no, not Mavic. I've got the DJI Mini 2, which is just uh, it's it's a really good drone, but it's affordable. Um, 
and uh, so I can get some really awesome rolling shots of the Proton and I can do proper audio demonstration with the RTA mics similar to how I did with the um, with the BenQ uh, electro electrostatic speakers that was a really good audio demo video so I can do lots of cool video stuff with the Proton just need to uh, wait for the weather to cheer up a bit and tidy the car up a little bit so this is what the Alpine looks like inside. So <laughs> you will not see this circuit anywhere else. This is I have big respect for Alpine. You know, this is this is a completely bespoke, unique circuit that Alpine have engineered from the ground up. Um, and it's beautiful, it's absolutely stunning. It's so nicely thought out, laid out. It's just it's it's like it's like looking at a piece of artwork. It's absolutely gorgeous. But the power supply here is a dual power supply. Um, so yeah, like it's it's properly dual power supply. Like each thing is completely separate. For, I, I'm pretty sure for each channel, each channel has its own like power supply, if you like, on the board. I don't, I don't think that they parallel um, after the inductors, which is which is really cool. And then you have your this is this is your power supply board over here. This is just responsible for turning 12 volts into plus minus rail voltage. Got some nice capacitors here. Now <laughs> these are uh, they, they say Alpine on them, but they won't be made by Alpine. But Alpine did manage to um, get whoever made them to actually not have their logo on them anywhere and just have the Alpine sticker, which is pretty cool. Uh, then you've got the output, output section with Class AB um, with the MOSFET final. Um, yeah, pretty nice bespoke circuit design. You've got um, the buff, the um, I think these are the bias transistors, which are actually clamped to the heatsink, which you can't always guarantee on these days. Uh, you've got your VCC voltage supply transistors clamped to the heatsink in the middle there, which is a nice touch. Um, you've got your bias potentiometers here and here. Um, Preamp circuit, you've got all these kind of upright op amps. Um, copper, you've got these little copper um, uh, clamps, like they'll act, act a bit better as heat spreaders because they're made of copper, which is nice. Loads of screws holding the board down, it's absolutely solidly like the build quality is amazing. You're not really going to suffer from vibration damage, I don't think. These, these could be a bit more. A bit more sturdy in there, but you know, at the end of the day, this isn't really for a big booming system. This is a nice amplifier. So anyway, let's see why would this amplifier be in the workshop? What's up with it? Why? Why is it here? First thing we're gonna do is just make sure that there's no out shorted output MOSFETs. So it's gonna go ahead and check between gate drain source of all the output FETs. See so what's see whether it's safe to power up or not. This 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 amplifier might be one that works fine actually. Um, the guy that sent this to me, um, I've got a feeling that he's the, he, he may have issues that aren't related to the amplifier being faulty. So no short output FETs. Power supply FETs probably won't be dead because there's no, no burns. Uh, if we go across the power and ground terminal, doesn't appear to be any shorts here in the power supply effect. So I'm going to go ahead and just throw some power in this and see what it does. It could be one of those cursed stream moments where this amp works fine. But at least you guys get to see it a little bit. Mike Honda, how's it going man? What's up? Good day. Um, got your JL Audio 1200-1 V3 amps apart for fun. Both work fine. I just took them apart for fun. That's actually a really good idea. Um, learn, how they go, learn how they work, learn how they go together. Um, that's one of the things that I recommend to people who are starting out learning amplifier repair. Buy some blown amplifiers, take them apart, probe them on the scope, understand how they work, get to know them. Um, yeah, working stuff is, is good fun to take apart as well, just to kind of see what's going on in there. Provided you can put it back together again and it still works, of course. Okay, power wires are in. I'm gonna turn on my frequency generator.
Wow, there's a lot of dust in the um, the filter switches on the side here. I wonder whether that could be something to do with it. <laughs> right, let's make sure the gain is turned down nice and low to start with. What's the problem with this device, says Nicholas? We don't know yet. That's what we're just trying to find out. Um, I haven't turned it on yet. There's, there doesn't appear to be any shorted MOSFETs or anything like that. So, um, yeah, just going to go ahead and power it up and see if it makes audio on any of the channels. It's only a little two channel, so. Okay. Power. A frequency gen. Uh, let's make sure the power supply comes to life. Fan spin. And we have power supply switching there. 1.7 amps worth of idle current draw. 20 kilohertz on the power supply switch. It's pretty slow. Now, output section then. Um, let's have a look. We're just looking for audio. So, nothing here. nothing here so what have I got this plugged into I've got this plugged into channel one so I should have some audio output on this um, on this terminal here oh wait here we go I have something okay so yeah we've got audio albeit very very low so it could just be because I've got the gain down low. So um, I'm going to go ahead and turn the gain up. It seems to be in um, low pass filter mode as well at the moment. Because uh, it wouldn't pass uh, the 300 hertz. I had to turn it down to 38. So I'm just going to go ahead and check the filters on the side. Uh, the filter, yeah, is set to low pass filter. So I'm going to turn it off. Just let all the frequencies through. I'm going to turn parametric EQ off. And same for this one. We're going to go for input mode. Mono, I think, so that I actually no, let's, let's go stereo. Stereo. So let's turn it back on again. I'm going to increase the gain a little bit on the front so we can um, just get a little bit more voltage in here. Level up a little bit. Turn the power supply up to about 12 volts. Can let me know it works. Okay, so yeah, there is our channel one which up to clip point as you can see. Um, so that's all looking good, it's working just fine. Let's go up the frequency range a little bit, make sure it still works at high frequencies. Looks good as well. Now let's try channel two. Which is just up here. <laughs> yep, channel two appears to be working fine as well. Curse of the live stream, this amp appears to work fine. I will give it some more testing later, but uh, yeah, it seems to work just fine. But at least you got to see the insides of it, and I do have another amplifier that we can look at in the meantime.
Oh, the Mavicas have a USB-B output. Oh, and it actually outputs the, the uh, video feed. Um, I doubt that it's in, in any sort of high resolution though, um, Billy. If, it, if, it, if it's in 1080, then that's amazing. Then, then maybe that's a good shower. I can grab a couple of those. If it actually has a USB output for the video feed that is, that is in HD. Okay, uh, let me go and grab something else for us to look at then. What else can I look at for you guys this evening? Let's have a look. I haven't prepared a great deal of stuff because, uh, like I say, this was a bit of a, a, a last minute stream. I was just like, hey, screw it, let's do a live stream. Uh, put a load on it. Um, genuinely. Uh, applying a load to these amplifiers doesn't affect whether it's going to work or not. If this works without a load, it's going to work with a load. But if you do so insist, I'll put a load on it and you can see for yourself. I'll hook up a... Um, I'll hook up a static load and a sub at the same time so that it's reactive and, and you know, because the sub's free air so it's going to be impedance rise through the roof so it won't really load the amplifier properly but so I'll load it with um, a, a resistive load as well as a reactive load just to kind of you know so here's my sub wires What I'm going to do is I'm going to put it into um, bridge mode. So I'm going to put it into mono, one channel, and that will let me just uh, bridge this. So just need to connect one side over to this terminal for this side bridge. Man, these uh, these grub screws have. Definitely seen better days, hey? Actually, that doesn't even clamp down properly, does it? Does that even clamp down properly? No, it doesn't. That, 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 that's lame. One side, let's go to the other side. The other the other channels terminals have actually been replaced with screws as you can see. Okay, so we have a sub hooked up and we have static loads hooked up. So let's turn this back on. Frequency down nice and low. 
turn the gain down nice and low. Another reason that I, th I know this is going to work is that the customer that this amps for, um, he, he could do with a little bit more knowledge in the audio, in, in the audio sense. Put it that way. So it's powered up. Uh, full, full rail, full voltage, full current. Oh, helps if I plug the RCA in. There we go. She playing. Here's a fun tip for you. So, let's say we don't know what the uh, resonant frequency of this subwoofer is. Okay, we want to find out what the um, what the FS of this sub is. All we have to do is play varying different frequencies and watch the current reading on the um, on the power supply here. Okay, so if we we turn it up a little bit, so at the moment I've got 34 hertz. And we've got 6.1 amps. Let's go. I oh, say so it's 35 hertz. Sorry, if we if we if we go up to 40 hertz, you can see here now we're drawing about seven point about seven amps. Yeah. So clearly, yeah. So clearly that is more current. So therefore, that's further away from the FS, whereas if we go down now to 30 hertz, now we're only drawing 4 amps, so the FS is closer to 30 hertz. So let's find out what the FS is. So I'm going to turn the gain up a little bit, so we've got a little bit more current draw. So we've got 6 amps at 30 hertz. Okay, 6 amps at 30 hertz, so what about 31 hertz, 32, 6.0, 33, 34, 30, 30, by 35 hertz we've got 6.2 amps, I'm going to turn up a little bit more, so we've got 10.3 now, or 8.8, 8. so let's go down back to 34 hertz, 8.4, 8.3, we're at 32, 31, 8.3. So now if I go to 28 hertz, we start going back up again in the current. So the FS of this sub is 28. It's at the lowest point of the current draw. So it is exactly here. It's pretty much exactly 30 hertz. Exactly 30 hertz is the is the FS of this, pretty much. Based on the current draw of this of this uh, amplifier here. So that's pretty cool, isn't it? That's working just fine, as expected.
Okay, so let's put this on the shelf then, as done. Uh, let's grab something else for your ass. most generic amplifier in the entire world, the Bass Face DB or 1.3. This is an insanely generic Chinese amplifier. So let's take a look and see what we got in this one. This one, oh, has something inside of it. Lovely. So it looks like we're going to actually break the um, warranty sticker on this one. I don't think it's ever been taken apart before, which is pretty cool. your sound source for frequency generating Nicholas asks um, it is it's it's just some really cheapo frequency generator I got it off eBay but it was used so I'm not it is <laughs> look at the brand name actually the brand name is called digi mess diggy diggy mess digi mess um, two megahertz function generator and it's really cheap it, it feels cheap and plasticky um, I had to replace the potentiometer in the uh, frequency poten uh, knob here it was originally a one of those potentiometers that has multiple turns I think it spanned around eight times um, in each direction and I actually hated that it took me forever to wind up the frequency so I actually just replaced the potentiometer with one that just does one single rotation or not even that not even one single rotation it's just under just a regular potentiometer um, I find that works much better I much prefer that but yeah the, the original one um, failed because there, there's a wire inside of that that it's like a kind of corkscrew mechanism of the old one um, and yeah the wire just snapped off but yeah it's, it's pretty cool like you can do all kinds of funky things with it you can change the you can uh, do a frequency sweep you can increase the width and the rate of the sweep you can change the uh, DC offset uh, on the wave you can do sine triangle and square waves um, you can trigger it externally so yeah it's this cool little thing but really really cheap and nasty really So, oh shit, okay. This thing has gone kaboom. But what's floating around in here? Something. Oh my god, it's a fucking bit of solder. Holy shit, from factory. So the warranty sticker was still intact on this. And inside of this amplifier, we have this. Holy shit. Look at the size of it absolutely gargantuan solder blob uh, I guarantee that that is shorted something out in here causing it to fail what the fuck oh 
I think there's another one actually. There's another one here waiting to come off. Look, just just there. Oh, is, is that actually proper so solid? And there's, there's a little bulge there that's a bit of solder. I wonder if that's actually um, stuck there. Yeah, that's actually part of the solder ball that is there. Now, there's a lot of excess solder in this one. Isn't it? So the failure then has happened, has occurred over here. So this is all blackened. A lot of soot on the board. Now when these ones die, this is the output fence. You don't usually get this in intense burning on the output fence. Like, wow, look at that. That's properly cracked open, that has. Kaboom, my friend. That has properly kaboomed. Nice. Don't usually see that on the output fence of these. Uh, so I think it probably was that solder blob that did that. You can see that there's an absolutely massive bit of the um, drain leg missing. So I reckon that solder ball just like went up and touched this here and caused that to, to blow out like that. That's insane. Good job. Right, let's see how many of the other MOSFETs are shorted as, as a result of that, shall we? Red Ford, how's it going, my man? So that one's dead. That one's dead. That one's not dead, probably. That one's dead. Holy shit. Those of them. That one's dead. There's one, one fet left on this side that was that was left intact. How about on the other side? Usually these just kill like one or two fets. Okay, other side remains intact. No dead fets on the other side. So yeah, I, I think it was because um, uh, someone just said in the in the live chat just now that it could have created that solder blob if something overheated, but. A solder blob that big? Nah, not from the MOSFET leg um, pads or anything like that. Um, and the fact that we've got this half of the amplifier with no dead MOSFETs and with output section faults, we don't, we never see this. We never see this like burning on the output FETs. So the power supply FETs will do this, yes. The output FETs, no. This, this happens when you've got something that's a low resistance. Sorry, yes, something that's a low resistance short, but it's high enough to prevent the amplifier from instantly shutting down or turning off. So that bit of solder was just like resting on those FET legs, sparking and arcing away and like getting super, super hot, but still not quite enough to shut the amplifier off at first until the, the FET exploded. Now, this is a cheap piece of crap. I think, I, I think we can do a top board repair of this one without having to take the whole thing out of the heatsink. You want to see a top board repair? For fun? It's pretty pretty easy. Actually, this, these are really, really easy to do a top board repair on. You don't even need to take the whole thing out of the heatsink. Um, especially with the power supply fets that are not dead. All I need to do is change the... Um, I, should, I should change all the output fets. Maybe I should take it out of the case. Yeah, screw it. We'll take it out of the case. The, these ones are really, really, really easy to do a top board repair on. Um, just because of how they are. How they are assembled and stuff. Phase, phase, AB 1.3. So even though the FETs on this side have survived, um, it's good practice to change all of them obviously. This amplifier's been in a bit of a dire situation. Be good to refresh it with all new output FETs. James Smith, how's it going, my man? Good to see you on the stream. Looking similar to my Sinus Live SLA1500. Yeah, it will probably be the same circuit, my friend. This is the most common circuit, car audio based subwoofer amplifier circuit that you will ever see. The most, the most common one. You'll see this circuit absolutely everywhere from cheap brands to expensive brands. Digital Designs offer an amplifier lineup with this same circuit.
These ones don't typically burn on the other side of the board. Um, the boards are nice and thick on these ones. The traces are quite thick on these V4s. This is the fourth version of this amplifier circuit. This is the fourth revision. And they really, really beefed up the traces and they, they're quite resilient to uh, trace breaks. So, but these are pretty quick to take apart. So might as well just take it apart. These amps any good, you don't hear much about them. Uh, that's because you're in the US. These are absolutely everywhere in the UK. This is a UK brand, so you won't see them in the US, but in the UK these are absolutely everywhere and they are shit. They are not very good. Pretty shocking. Okay, five more screws and we can slide her out. Yeah, so the actual wires inside the amplifier usually are branded with all different kinds of brands. So in this one it looks to be unbranded, but sometimes you'll see audio pipe uh, wire branding in here. You also tend to see audio pipe wire branding in some more expensive <laughs> brand amplifiers like uh, oh, What's the funniest one I've seen audio pipe branding in? Oh, God, it was something like a Sundown or a DC or what was it? Was it Ground Zero? There was one. There was one funny amplifier that I saw, and the uh, the wires inside were branded audio pipe, and it was like it was like a premium brand amplifier. Quite jokes. Daniel Dory says, "Does that have pull down resistors?" Yes but only in the third and fourth revision. So this is the fourth revision of this circuit from base face, but in the first and second revision, there were no rail cap pull down resistors. So you could power the amplifier up and leave it for like six months and it would still have like 200 volts worth of potential voltage sitting inside there ready to shock you if you try to take it apart. But this one does have two pull down resistors, one here and one here for the rails. So yeah, that's good. So let's take a peek on the other side of the board then, and as I suspected, that MOSFET that blew horrendously, the back of the PCB looks absolutely immaculate. So yeah, these ones, that the, the back of the PCB doesn't ever really get damaged, even if there's quite a lot of damage on the top, it tends to just be fine with these blue ones. So yeah, we could have done top board repair, but it's still a bit easier to do it from the, um, from the back, isn't it, to be honest, so... Tech Specialist, yeah, the, these amps, they are very cheap to buy and they're fine on subs. They have, actually, they have a very, very low idle current draw, which is cool. These amps run idle and they, they draw like barely even an amp, like point, point 0.5, point 0.6 of an amp sometimes on these things. Um, so yeah, they're, they're pretty, pretty cool little things, um, but the output drive strength is horrendously poor. So these amplifiers will kill output MOSFETs at random um, just because the drive circuit is so weak. And the reason it's so weak is actually the main reason that they're so easy to repair. The reason that the output drive circuit, the, the drive signals to the MOSFETs is so weak is because, right, you have the drive board here. This is the thing that's generating the pulses, converting your audio into PWM. Then this passes the PWM onto a pair of optocouplers. So you see you've got an optocoupler here and an optocoupler here, okay? So these are electrically isolating the output MOSFETs and all the high voltage bullshit that goes on when these amps die from the driver card. So the driver card in these never fails. I have not 
once. Bearing in mind, I've, re I've repaired hundreds of these boards, literally hundreds, maybe even thousands of these boards. Not one time have I ever had any component fail on the driver card. I've had one or two times where the optocoupler themselves will fail, but very, very rare. The only thing you ever need to replace in these amplifiers when they die is MOSFETs, gate resistors, and drive transistors. There's literally two tiny little drivers or three tiny little drivers, two X and two T drive transistors just here. Replace the drivers, replace the, the gate resistors, replace the FETs, and it will work every time, 99.9% .9 of the time. So they're, they're really cool to learn on and to like build your confidence with amplifier repair because you can bang these out and feel good about it. So I'm just going to take all these stanky fets out and get to replacing these, sucking the holes and whacking some new fets in. And uh, what I will do is I will show you what the drives now, the, actually, another cool thing about this, another cool thing about these circuits for repairing them is that they actually give you visible drive waves on the low side and on the high side with the MOSFETs removed. That's very rare. Usually, with these um, Class Ds that use bootstrapping for the high side supply, usually you must have MOSFETs fitted in order to see the high side drive without the MOSFETs in. But with these little bad boys, they actually provide you with the um, high side drive even when you haven't got the MOSFETs fitted. I've been too used to using my big ass soldering iron. This thing feels really weak and slow now. I've been using the big one for loads of stuff lately. Uh, so I just thought I'd turn this one on because it heats up a little bit quicker, obviously. But I've got so used to the, the power of the big one that this one just feels really pissy weak now. It seems to take ages to like melt these solder joints. The big one. You touch it on here for two seconds and the MOSFET just falls off the board instantly. It's awesome. This thing just takes a little bit more, a bit more effort. This was the dead one that all the legs snapped off on. Okay, just going to check for solder bridges because we're going to be powering this up without the MOSFETs in. Just want to make sure there's no bridges on the back. Flip around.
Man, you guys are quiet this evening in the live chat. What type of core can I use to wind a new output inductor for that has the that circuit or the same circuit amp? Um, I'm not, not too sure really. Like, if if I ever need to repair a tra uh, an inductor or transformer, I'll just use the original core if I can. Um, haven't really had to replace a core any time that I can think of. Really, I've always just been able to reuse the core and just rewind it to original spec. But I do know that there are different um, types of core that, and it, that, it is important to make sure you use the right type, whether you're, you know, uh, winding an inductor or a transformer, or whatever it might be. I do know that there are different types and that that's going to be important. Okay, let's make sure no solder bridges on this one either. All right, so yeah, let's just power it up and show you guys. Yeah, like I say, this is one of the cool things about these circuits is they do give you, when they're working, um, high side and low side drive without the MOSFETs fitted, which is um, which is pretty cool. You can make sure that both both halves of that are good. Alright, cool. So now let's uh, shove some power wires in and power it up. The power supply is okay on this one, which is nice. Zed just said, just fix one of these in the audio pipe 2K. Had eight rectifiers. Oh, really? Yeah, this one's, these ones only use four. Um, and yeah, you have to discharge the rail caps every time. It's fucking pain in the ass. You can just solder a big resistor, um, like a big, like, you know, 3K, 3 kilo ohm resistor uh, across the rail caps if you want. So that, it, so that it just discharges itself rather than you having to discharge it every time. But yeah, big, big pain in the ass. Alright, so now we've got power, let's go ahead and turn the supply on. Crank the voltage down, don't need 13 volts, probably only need about 10, 9.5, something like that. Uh, so we're just checking for drive waves now then, on low side and high side, because this is a cool little amplifier. So let's just get a little bit of rail voltage to start with. So that's positive rail there. Now, for, now nicely, we don't have any um, DC voltage on the gate or source, which is a good sign so far. So positive rail is just there. Negative, uh, negative rail is going to be over here. And yeah, there doesn't seem to be any DC where there shouldn't be. So I'm going to probe low side gate first, just to see that we have um, the correct PWM on low side gate. Okay, we've got 0.6 amps worth of idle current draw. Uh, yeah, we have what looks like pretty nice. Um, low side gate drive there as you can see on the scope screen cool so let's move our probe over to the high side gate uh, yeah we have high side gate drive as well now, the high side gate drive will also will always look a little bit wobbly that's absolutely fine you get a little bit of noise and, and wobble on this one on the high side gate drive for these absolutely fine nothing to worry about whatsoever the low side um, gate drive however should look nice and clean and sharp like this yeah. 
So yeah, that appears to be working fine. So I think we're safe just to drop the new fets in and that should just be good to go. Um, I'm going to short out the rails to speed things up. Even though it has got pull down resistors, they take ages. So got negative rail is just there and positive rail is just there. So let's go ahead and put a 16 ohm load across them. Wow, thank you very much to Door75 for the 100 sec. Uh, I don't know what that, that, con that um, converts as, but it's orange, so it's, it's a reasonable amount. Thank you very much, my man. Appreciate that. If you've got any questions, give me a shout. Thank you very much for, for your kindness there. That's awesome. So many live streams this year. Yeah, I'm trying to do trying to do as many as I can. I'm trying to just kind of start streaming whenever I start repairing and just kind of see how it goes rather than trying to plan it too much. So, okay, cool. Let's grab some more 640Ns. See how this amplifier takes ye old classic IRF 640N. Nice cheap MOSFET. So I absolutely loads of these. Let's find some of the, the same batch. I've got all, a big mix, mix of batches because I bought like a thousand of these or something and they, they came as all different batches which is a pain in the ass. Got some HX there, HG there. So I need uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, I need 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So the, uh, the CT batch is almost the winner. 9, 10, I think that's 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. Yeah, cool, that's good to go. Bang these in here. And uh, before we power it up as well, I do just want to make sure actually all the gate resistors are good. So just going to make sure all the gate resistors are intact. So this is the good side that didn't have any issues. On the multimeter, it reads 32 between gates. Um, oh, hey, actually. Wow, one of the gate resistors this side actually is open, which is really unusual because the MOSFETs were okay on this side. Okay, so yeah, we need a, a replacement 10 ohm gate resistor on this side here. Cool, good to know. And also, by the looks of it, one over here. Shit. So two gate resistors failed on this side, even though there were no dead FETs. That's pretty unusual. On this side, we need... That's okay, that's okay, that's okay. That one's clearly obviously dead. And that one's dead. Okay, so we need four 10 ohm gate resistors. I'm actually gonna change those before I put the FETs in just because it's a little bit easier to do that that way around. Let's clean all, all the soot off the board over here. So she looks nice and spicy clean again, sparkly. A little bit of heat damage on the board, but it actually looks fine. It cleans up really nicely. Yeah, there's a tiny little bit of like yellowing or like greening on the board there, but um, in reality, it's fine. Okay, let's find some replacement resistors. I hope I've got some 10 ohms. I tend to use the 10 ohms all the time, so I might have run out soon. Then... 
I was looking for some 100 ohm resistors the other day and I, I thought I didn't have any, but I clearly did. Ah, oh, there we go, there's some 10 ohms, got those left still. That's good. So, yep, got to replace these two ones just over, uh, what is it, over here. I think these two were dead, weren't they? Yeah. This one here. And this one here. And then over this side, it was that one. This one just here. And then it was this one right by the cap. Cool, cool. Refresh the solder on those. With some tasty 6040. I'm Jimmy from Kentucky, long time fan. I watch you from a YouTube on a fire stick usually, so I can't usually comment, but now, but for now, just saying um, hi, wish someone in Kentucky that I'm prepared. Uh, thank you very much, Jimmy. Thanks for jumping on and saying hi, I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, I, pre I know a lot of um, a lot of people watch from their TVs or you know, smart TV, um, places where it's not really super easy to comment on. So I really appreciate you jumping on, uh, on the comments to say hi. Um, I'm glad you enjoy the content. I hope you're having a great day. I hope you're looking forward to a nice weekend. Um, yeah, there, there are there are a lot of guys in the states that do amplifier repair. Um, I don't know any in Kentucky. I don't, I don't actually know where they actually are. I'm just in a big group of them on Facebook, and there's loads of guys in the states. So if you if you are happy to post your amp out to someone, then there's loads of really great techs in the US that could uh, help you out. Okay, there's our four resistors. A little bit of solder flux, just to guide them into place neatly. One and two. Get that solder nicely cooked up on the FETs. It doesn't matter what way round the resistors go in, but I hate it when they're upside down. Like sometimes, just like just then, a surface mount resistor will like want to be upside down. It will like flip over. And it, it doesn't matter which way round the resistor is. It works the same both way rounds. But I, I just the like OCD. I can't. I can't have the resistor being upside down. Uh, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you wouldn't either. I actually repaired another one of these boards earlier, another another base phase DP1.3, I repaired one of these earlier that actually did have some of the resistors that were back, backwards from the factory, <laughs> they were upside down, like the, the so they just showed the white belly and the, the actual marking was on the other side. I found that quite hilarious because I've not really seen that ever from factory before. Okay, there we go, it's four new gate resistors. So now we should have continuity between all of these. Yep, and on the other side we should have continuity between all of these. Yep, looks good. Cool, ready for some fetch then.
make sure these are all the same height. Not that it really matters, they're all going to be clamped to the heatsink the same, but again, the old, uh, the old OCD kicking in, just want to make sure they're all the same height. Nice, nice. I'm just soldering the gate leg in from the top just to hold them in place and then we'll flip her over and solder, solder them all in from the bottom nice and neatly just to kind of tap, tack them in place, tack them in place. Hang on a minute, well have we have only got four MOSFETs left? Uh, <laughs> I counted ten didn't I? One, two, three, four. Where's the fifth one? <laughs> Guys, it's freaking disappeared. CT batch. There we go. Station says, oh, it's also a good idea to have all the markings in the same direction as well. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. Um, Make make things a little bit quicker when you when you're looking at the board for sure. Oh, I, I know why I screwed up. It's not five per side; it's six per side. So there's actually twelve that I need. Obviously, can't count. I need to go back to the school. Good. Okay, so that's all the MOSFETs tacked in, so now we can go ahead and flip her over and solder all the other legs in from the back, from the base. The, uh, the gate leg is pretty much just like a logic level, um, doesn't need massively high thermal, doesn't need massively high um, you know, contact area or anything, but the, uh, these two do. These are the uh, source and drain, which have the rail voltage on them. And the output, uh, you know, the output to the speaker. So they need to be soldered with a decent amount of conductivity.
Okay, so that's all the MOSFET soldered in now, so we can go ahead and power it up and just make sure that we have output switching. Uh, now, occasionally, occasionally with these amps, um, the drive waves will look absolutely fine without the MOSFETs fitted. However, the drivers will actually be slightly damaged, whereby they will not actually be able to drive the MOSFETs properly. Uh, so we are not in safe ground yet. We do need to power it up and just absolutely make sure that this thing switches the low side correctly, not only with 9 volts, but also with a 14 volts. So let's go ahead and um, attach our, our oscilloscope probe there to low side drain. I'll just hold it. Okay. So let's touch that on there. Power that for up and make sure we have output, swi output switching. Oh, we don't. We have a great big swing to negative rail. See? What was I saying? So sometimes it looks like the amplifier could be working fine. However, when it goes to switch, it actually doesn't, it isn't unable to do so. So, what happened there is the amplifier powered on and tried to enable the switching, and when it did so, there was a great big, um, all you know, there was it just swung to, to, to negative rail. Okay. Now, when that happened, it either the components were fine. That either happened and the components were fine, or it may have actually killed one of the low side MOSFETs because that, that negative um, rail voltage was still there even after the amplifier turned off. So we just want to go ahead and make sure. Actually, it looks like they're fine. We still have negative rail voltage there, 22 on negative and 21 on positive. So if there was any shorted FETs, then then the, the, one of the rail voltages would be missing and we would still have the um, negative DC on the drain here, which we don't. So because that, because we don't have the uh, DC on the drain anymore, I suspect you know the MOSFETs survived that. That, that instance wasn't a, um, a stress for the MOSFETs, uh, but what, what, what did happen was the drive circuit was not driving the MOSFETs properly, even though it looked fine when we tested it without MOSFETs in. So that's something to, to bear in mind and remember with these circuits. So what I'm going to go ahead and do now is I'm just going to go ahead and replace all six of the drive transistors, which are the only only things left on these boards that can cause this issue. Uh, I'm also just going to make sure that the gate resistors are still okay. Uh, David, thanks very much, my man. Thanks for the 10 bucks. Happy Friday. Happy Friday to you too, my dude. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you, dude. Hope you're having a good one. Hope you have a great weekend, dude. Thank you very much. That's cool. That's badass. So we'll make sure that uh, all the gate resistors are still fine. So what, what may have been the case is that one of the gate resistors was reading okay before, but as soon as it had a bit of power through it, it just kind of gave up. So just want to make sure that all the gate resistors are still okay. Yep, they're still alright. So it's going to be the drive circuit. So let's go ahead and zoom in and replace the drive circuit. It's very quick and easy to do if you have drive circuit faults with this amplifier and you'll feel like a boss for fixing it because you'll be like, ah, heck yeah, I fixed drive circuit fault. So the drivers in these amplifiers are three little transistors here. One, two, three in this like little diagonal shape. And there's another three over from this side. One, two, three. So uh, we could try and find which one is the faulty one, but at the end of the day, they're cheap, tiny little things. Just replace all of them. You might as well. It's going to save you, save you time. Just replace all of them. Why not? We're going to take these six off the board and we're going to go ahead and replace those. Um, we've got um, two NPNs here and here, which are marked 2X, and then a PNP here. The PNP is always the last one on its own. Same on this, this side, we've got a PNP here, 2T, and then two, t, t, uh, two, two Xs, which are the NPNs there.
as the two NPNs coming off first. Now this PNP, this has quite a bit of thermal mass on the top pin, this top pin here. So I'm going to aim my heat gun at the thick trace here, a little bit further away from the, um, the transistor actually, just to kind of get some heat energy into this part of the trace first before we go ahead and blast the um, actual transistor. Okay, now let's try and remove this. There we go, that came off way easier than I'm used to, so yeah, doing that massively helps. Let's go on the other side. PNP. NPN. NPN. Cool, let's get our replacements. So we need two, two T's, which are these ones. One, two, and we need four two X's. Which are these ones. One, two, three, four. Put these drawers back. We're going to refresh the solder on these pads, make it easier to solder on. go. Bit of fresh flux. Flux is your best friend, especially good shit like this. And let's get these bad, bad boys on. So we need a PNP here. NPNs over here. That's one side all, all changed. Let's do the other side. I'm going to preheat this high thermal mass trace again. This one here. I'm just going to preheat this on the trace before we try and attach the um, transistor. It's going to get some heat soaked into this board a little bit. To use a fume extractor, I used to have one that was attached to my soldering iron tip. Um, so it was just like a little nozzle that came came right next to the soldering iron tip that sucked away all the fumes um, as I was soldering, which was quite effective. Uh, the nozzle did get in the way a lot of the time, though. Um, the reason I took it off was because it sucked the solder fumes away into the same um, pump mechanism 
which my soldering iron station uses for the hot air gun and it had absolutely no filters so the problem was is that it would suck up all the solar fumes it would get completely clogged up with sticky um, flux juice and like sticky shit inside uh, which would then make the um, pump ineffective so the hot air gun would actually overheat because it wasn't getting enough airflow through because it was all junked up with solar flux and it was a real pain in the ass to clean so I, I just took off the fume extractor and now I actually have a fan um, by the desk like a you know just a, a, a regular desk fan um, and if I'm doing anything where there's like a shit lot of soldering to do like repairing a big 10k or 12k amp that has like 32 output MOSFETs that I need to solder in you know with a shitload of flux that's going to create a lot of fumes then yeah I will turn the fan on and I'll also wear a mask I have a face mask that I can put on like a fume, fume proper uh, professional fume mask not just one of these shitty COVID masks, like an actual proper mask that has a, the, one of the detachable filters built in and stuff. Um, you know, the plastic filter cap capsules. Um, so yeah, if I'm doing any any work with a, with a shitload of flux, oh for fuck's sake, what you're doing? Then uh, I'll, I'll use that. Ah, fucking, these tweezers are so annoying because they're ever so slightly magnetic. Where's my other ones? Don't get tweezers that are magnetic, guys. I've, I've seem to have lost my nice tweezers. I've got some really nice ones that I, I used to use all the time. They're, they're like aluminium or something. They're not magnetic, but those ones they're magnetic and they're bloody pain in the ass. That's better. The, the tip's a bit too fat on these ones for my liking, but it does the job for now. Alright, there we go. So, let's wait for this to cool down a little bit. Uh, and then power it on again and see if we get switching. Uh, like I said, I think the MOSFETs survived that. I don't think they shorted. Yeah, so w whatever that drive circuit fault was, I think we they, they survived it. Can you get a demagnetizer for your tweezers? Uh, maybe. I don't know. A little bit of isopropyl alcohol just to clean this up and to help it cool down a bit. Okay, cool, I think we're ready now for a bit of power. So again, 9.5 volts, and um, hopefully now this does give us the class D switching and not a big swing to negative rail like we had. And I don't think there's any solar bridges, is there? Because that would prevent it from coming on at all in the first place. Yeah, no, we're good. Okay, so take two then. There we go. So yeah, that was just a drive circuit fault there. Um, yeah, 0 0.6 amps worth of idle current draw. That is the same amount of idle current draw that this amplifier had before we even fitted FETs. So it's a very well optimized little circuit. Now, the reason that I say that these things are a shitty and they kill the output FETs all the time, take a look at the state of the low side drive wave. Oh, actually, it's a bit better in these. Huh. It's actually, it's actually a little better in these ones. In the DB1.4s, it's horrendous. Okay, that's not so bad. Um, you've got a little bump there, um, just as it just as it turns on. Oh, 
Come on, focus, you piece of shit. Come on, focus. Yeah, you got a little a little bump there, just just where it, it turns the FET on. Um, that's just due to a really weak drive. But actually, that's not so bad. That's that's better than I was expecting. Uh, I think maybe the old ones just have really poor drive. Maybe these new ones are actually all right. Alright, fair play. Fair play, base face. As you were. Uh, let's crank up the voltage, make sure it's still good even at a higher voltage. We've got 9 volts, 12 volts, 13 volts, 15 volts. Yeah, that's all good. Still drawing 0.6 of an amp. That's wild, isn't it? So efficient, these little things. Well, I say efficient. That doesn't mean anything about their efficiency. It just means that they are very like op well optimised for idling. Do you use an anti-static wristband? No, no, I don't. No, that's that. That's that's nothing that needs. To need, that's not a concern for. Not not even a concern for most circuits, but especially not these type of circuits. Watch the video where Linus from Linus Tech Tips tries to get static electricity to kill some computer components with Electroboom. That will then completely change your perspective on whether you need to worry about electrostatic discharge when working on electronics. Evening, how's it going? Bl Blisterio. Alright, cool. Let's put this back in the case and it should be right. some thermal paste on here if you please we don't really need any new thermal paste on the power supply fits because they still have the original paste from factory which will still be in the same position that it was in on the fits but you know, I could apply some more for good measure why not So yeah, I think that's it for now. Um, just going to put this back in the sink and then it's good. So if you guys have got any questions you want to ask um, about anything, then give me a shout before we go. And I have this, I have this far side as well. Actually, yeah, let's do this one. I haven't actually got a hotkey set up for this one um, at the moment. So let's just let's, let's put this camera on and read some live chat. Move this over a little bit here. There we go. That way. There we go. I've used it, seen a few amps using cap Capton tape as the insulator between FETs and chassis. Does it actually transfer heat? Yes, it does. It's pretty good at it as well. It's it's so 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 thin. That's the thing. So even if it might like the actual properties of the um, the actual properties of Capton, Capcon, Capton itself might not necessarily be extremely like thermally, you know, conductive or whatever. The fact that it's so unbelievably thin, um, it actually does a really, really good job. Uh, it's pretty good. It's very electrically insulating as well. It's, it's a very good electrical insulator. So yeah, it works works great both ways. It's a great electrical insulator. Uh, if you make it thin enough, then it um, insulates heat. Uh, sorry, it, it passes heat pretty well while electrically insulating. It's a good thermal conductor when it's that thin, so that's cool. 
And uh, what else are we going to say about it? Um, yeah, it's cheap. Daniel Doria, I'm free all weekend, just let me know. No worries, my man. So basically, Daniel, that you see in the live chat just there, uh, we're going to be doing a, a live stream with Daniel. We're going to do a live stream where we try and get Daniel's amp repaired from here. So basically, Daniel's over in the States, I think, and I'm over in the UK, and um, Daniel would like some help repairing his amplifier that he's got. Which I think would be really a really fun stream, a really good content stream. So basically, it will be like, can we help Daniel fix his amplifier? So naturally, I'll be giving as many tips as I can and guiding him through, but also live chat as well. So if any of you guys in the live chat are experienced technicians, um, look out for the live stream, which will be called something like, can we remotely fix this guy's amplifier, or something along those lines. It'll be like, can we help? Can we fix an amp from overseas, or can can we help? Can you know, can we fix this guy's amp from something something miles away or something like that? So yeah, if you want to join in on that stream, get involved um, and help get help Daniel get his amp up and running, then look out for that stream. And it's the sort of thing we could do now. Um, it's a little bit late in the UK just now. Um, I haven't sort of I haven't prepared or set up for that uh, just yet. There's a little, little bit of setup that we need to do with OBS and with the streaming um, software and stuff to get that running. Um, we're, we're pretty much there though. It looks good at the minute with uh, the tests that me and Daniel have been doing last week. So yeah, should be a good stream. Should be good fun. Can you give a, a brief explanation of bootstrap circuits in amplifiers? Craig, that is an absolute freaking monster of a question. Awesome question. Um, yes. In order to explain that though, I might draw something on Microsoft Paint. So if you just bear with me, I'll try and explain bootstrap. So even though I have been able to repair car amplifiers for many years now, um, because I never took any electronics classes or did any background, you know, kind of learning or education or anything like that, the info, you know, my, my, my base knowledge is quite poor. So even though I was able to repair amplifiers for a long time by knowing what to change and knowing what to look for, for a long time I didn't actually know how the bootstrap worked on the high side. And I think I've got a re relatively good idea of how it works now. So I can try and explain how I think it works. And then any experienced technicians in the live chat can uh, offer their insight and corrections where necessary. So I'll, I'll, do, I'll do a little, I'm just going to put these, uh, these screws in here to make sure this works. Did you get anywhere with that amp with a dodgy driver board? Um, putting the amp in to protect. Uh, basically, that one, I'm, uh, it, it's still in process, but I'm waiting uh, on the drive chip. So that amp, it needed a new output driver driver chip anyway for the MOSFET driver, um, which was a IRS 2014-2, 2014-2, 2014-2, 2014-2, 2014-2, 2014-2, 2014-2, 2014-2, 2014-2, 2014-2, 2014-2, 2014-2, 2014-2, 2014-2, 2014-2, 2014-2, 2014-2
the clip point at 12 volts is different to the clip point at 14 volts, for example. So um, if you set your gains uh, with your voltage at 15, then if your voltage is running 16, you've got a bit of extra headroom. Uh, personally, what I would say to you, my friend, um, Blisterio, is that you have the benefit of the Stetson amplifier having a clip LED built in. So with, with amplifiers that have a clip LED built in, you don't really need to set your gains the old school way because you can actually see when your amp is clipping on the fly. So you can kind of turn your gain up to like, I don't know, halfway or three quarters and then start increasing your music and uh, you know up and up and up until until you it sounds good and increase your bass knob um, get the bass like pumping and then if you see the clip light come on then okay go and turn the gain down a little bit and fine tune it with the subwoofer level on your head unit or on your DSP or something like that or you can even actually have have the bass knob and just kind of like be setting the gain every single time you demo but on the fly every track will have a different level of bass and a different you know different loudness of bass so really you can turn your gain up quite high and kind of have used the bass knob to kind of just be set, setting the level of the sub amp just under clip point all the time you know you can do it on the fly so you know, you'd be playing one tune driving along down the road playing one tune and um you know, you turn the bass knob up and you see it clipping. Oh, cool, that's clipping. Yeah, just that, turn it down a little bit. And then with that tune on, you roll up into the car park and you give your, your friend a, a, a demo with a, with, a, with a decaf track or something like that. And you turn your bass knob down a bit and the track starts. And then you turn it up and, and it starts clipping at a slightly lower point. You're like, okay, cool, that's the point for this track. And so then you, you the demo goes on. So yeah, really, if I'm perfectly honest, amplifiers that have clip lights, even in my own installs, I just kind of set the gain to some decent level that gives me a bit of headroom in the bass knob, and then I just turn the bass knob up until I see it clip and turn it back down a little bit for for every scenario for whatever it is I'm doing. I, you know, I don't ever, I don't really set the gain to like a fixed point and leave it there forever. If that makes sense, I'm just kind of like doing it on the fly with the bass knob, uh, depending on the track and depending on the situation, scenario, etc. Right, cool. That's now back in the case. Just gonna make sure there's no shorts to heatsink. A uh, really important thing to do before you put the back back on the amplifier, after you've screwed everything to the case, just make sure that none of your MOSFETs are shorted to the case, like this. Power supply and rectifiers as well. That's just charging cap. Charging cap. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, really important to check that, make sure that none of the FETs that you've just fitted are shorting to the case, either due to a little bit of solder perhaps, that's floating around in there. Okay, cool, I think we can put the uh, screws back on this now. Been subbed since the four inch sub in the Proton. Wow, that was years ago. Holy crap. Um, what cars do you have now? Uh, the, the, the same. <laughs> I still have the Proton as my daily, and the only addition is my base van, my, my Vito, um, which uh, has the two 15 inch DDZ 415s in it on about 20k. Um, but I still have the Proton and I use it every day. Well, not every day because I don't go, for, go somewhere every day, but anytime I need to go out, jump in the Proton. Yeah, still have it. Still going strong. Haven't changed vehicles since then at all.
Ta-da! Okay, cool. All done. I'm just going to power it up one last time to make sure that it still powers up after putting it in the, in the heat sink. Should do. Yep, there we go, blue light, 0 0.8, 0 0.6 amps worth of idle current draw, that's 14 volts. Yeah, looks good. That's working beautifully. Excellent day. There was one thing I wanted to test actually, I wanted to test the base knob on this, but it's getting a bit late. Um, one thing that I did want to do is I want to show you how I think bootstrap works, and you can tell me that it's wrong, and you can tell me how it actually works. Um, so, basically, what I think it is, is that you've got your... Uh, this would be much easier to actually just draw with a pen and paper, because I suck at using MS Paint. Um, so obviously you've got your output MOSFETs, right? So you've got your low side, low side FET here, and you've got your high side FETs here, right? So this is your high side, and this is your low side, and down here is your low side. Right, so low side, is connected to negative rail, right, on the source. High side is connected to positive rail on the drain. Right, and then you have obviously gate drive here and here um, and your high side um, your high side source is actually connected through to your low side drain okay like that so the source is kind of like the ground if you like um, it's, it's what the it's what the FET is using for its ground reference. Okay, so the ground reference for the low side is negative rail, which is which is uh, just just straight up DC like this. Okay, so that, that, that's that's just a line of DC. Okay, so the um, that's the negative rail. So the the gate drive, in order for the MOSFET to turn on and off, the gate drive needs to be turning on about tw like you know 12 volts above the negative rail which is why you see the low side riding along negative rail so the gate always needs to be about you know some voltage above the source the gate needs to be some voltage above the source in order for the FET to turn on and pass voltage from source to drain okay so that's why that looks like that okay so you've got the the negative rail so that, 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 that gate, that's connected to that, that's what the gate drive is, and the negative rail is this line right here, okay? So that's quite easy to understand, you've got just ground or negative rail, and then 12 volts above, negative rail, and then down to negative rail again, so it's turning the MOSFET on and off. However, we can see here that the high side has the source connected to the low side drain. Now on the output of the low side drain, Naturally, you're going to have great big feckin' class D switch wave. You're going to have rail to rail switching. Okay? Like this on the low side drain. With ground being in the middle here. Let's make that look a bit nicer. Like that. Okay? Um, so negative rail is going to be down here, and positive rail is going to be up here. So you've got rail-to-rail -rail switching on the low side drain, this one. 
Okay. So that's also going to be up here as well on the high side source. So how the hell does that work? So in order then for the high side to turn on, what needs to happen is you need to have, let me just copy paste this. Right, in order for the high side to turn on, you've got to have on the gate, you've got to have greater than the voltage read that, that's, that's currently being read on the source. So on the high side gate, you've got to have something that looks like this. Uh, I'm going to have to get this right here. Um, uh, on the high side gate, it's going to end up looking like it's, it's going to be ever so slightly above. Uh, fuck, what is it? Uh, I think it's going to be. Hang on, so off. Off is. So when the. Hang on a minute. <laughs> I fucking remember this. I think it's going to look like this maybe or it might it might be slightly higher on both sides it's ever so slightly above positive rail so you actually get ever so slightly above positive rail in order for the mosfet to turn on i might have this backwards it might it might actually be on the bottom there but i think i think that's what it is so you get slightly above um positive rail so how how does the drive circuit create something that's above positive rail. So what it has is you have the bootstrap circuit which takes the the low side uh, drain, which takes the, the class D, the actual output from the low side, which is this rail to rail switching, right? So you've got rail to rail switching on here, okay? Like this over the bootstrap circuit. And it takes that and it puts it through a circuit that has a capacitor in series so you end up you have a capacitor in series with this right and i think there's a there's a diode as well hang on a minute is it a, is it a diode first and then a capacitor or is it a capacitor and then a diode there's a there's a capacitor and a diode right i, I can't remember which fucking way around it is um what's the symbol for a diode again oh, this might even be backwards but there's a capacitor and a diode, right? Essentially, what happens is, is the um, is that even the sign for a diode? Uh, fuck it. All right. Um, anyway, there's a diode and a capacitor, and what it does is the the PWM on the low side drain charges a capacitor through the diode. I think it's, it's, it's the diodes first. Fuck it. It's the diodes first, right? That, that's what it is. The diode is first. Okay. So there's a diode, which is probably not this way round. It, hang on, it must be, it must be, no, in the other way round. It must be this way. It must be this way round. Yeah, 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 this is it, this is it, this is it. So what you end up with is you end up with this here, that there, capacitor. And then you have negative, uh, what is it? Sorry, you have positive rail is injected uh, at the one part one point of this I think po positive rail is injected somewhere like here I think or maybe it's this side of the capacitor and what basically what ends up happening is that this PWM ends up charging this capacitor to about 12 or 15 volts above positive rail because of the constant pulses, okay? So it's like a pulse is coming through the diode, it charges the capacitor a bit. Pulse is coming through the diode, it charges the capacitor a bit. So this, this capacitor ends up like 15 volts roughly above, um, above, oh fuck it, I can't draw it. Why don't I just use text? <laughs> above positive rail. So this, this 15 volts above positive rail this then gets sent to the supply voltage on the drive chip for high side supply. So this is your drive chip, right? 
<laughs> Let's call it a drive ship. Fucking hell, I don't care. So this is your drive ship. <laughs> right? So you've got out output for the low side, right? That's that's so you've got gate output for low side, okay? Gate output for high side. That's fine. You've got low side supply. Low supply VCC. I'm just gonna call it low VCC for now, okay? So low low supply, low side supply voltage, high side supply. Hi Vic. Um, and then you've also got uh, there's another one. So your your high your high high side supply will actually be this 15 volts above positive rail. Your low side supply is just negative rail. Because that, that's that's how that works. But the high voltage supply is this 15 volts above positive rail. But it's also a wave. It's like oh, hang on, man, I'm a bit confused. High voltage supply will also be a wave, but it will be like a wave that's 15 volts above the PWM. I, I realise that I understand this a little bit less than I thought I did, but essentially, essentially, it, it's made up of a. There's a, a basic, basically, it's a diode and a capacitor. The low side PWM charges a capacitor to slightly higher than positive rail voltage, I think, which then forms the basis, which which it put, forms the the voltage that the high side gate works on to enable the MOSFET on the high side to turn on because it needs to be above positive rail. Um, but it does it with the low side output as its supply, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'm sure there's a better way of explaining that. I'm pretty sure there's a great bit on Perry's guide that explains how, exactly how it works. <laughs> what sound system do you have in a small blue car? Uh, nothing at the minute. Um, no, uh, the oh no, we don't have no. The mini's not mine. The mini's my parents. Um, that's, down, that's back down where we used to live at my parents' house. There, this stock system in that, nothing, nothing in that. How come sometimes your stream doesn't turn into a normal video? It always does. Can do yourself like a professional. Every single live stream I do is always turns into a video on my channel. Bootstrap is a diode pump circuit. Awesome, Prolux Electronics. Thank you very much for that. Let's um, let's do a quick Google of that. So maybe we can get a um, skim like a schematic of that. Oh no, <laughs> I've just Googled your name. <laughs> diode pump circuit. That's what we need. We need a schematic, basic, generic schematic for a diode pump circuit. Let's have a look. Oh wait, circuit lab. This is this this is a simulation. Oh, that's cool. So this is this is going to be your um, yeah. So this is going to be your PWM probably from the low side uh, drain. So we have a capacitor first. Then we have a diode to gr to ground. A diode that way round. Oh okay. So it's going to pull that way. Negative out. Using a simple diode pump to generate negative supply rail from ah here we go. So this is basically doing the opposite to the high side. I think the high side would do the same as this, but for positive output rather than negative output. Note that the pulse source can have any DC offset. It's decoupled by C1. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Makes makes perfect sense. Is a swing the pulse in that determines the output voltage. I wonder if we can find one that actually matches the um, diode pump circuit bootstrap. And maybe amplifier bootstrap.
Wait, that's not what I wanted. What? No? Show me how freaking... Uh. Actually, a good a good way to show you actually will probably just be by looking at the um, yeah, let's look at the IRS two one nine two or the uh, IRS two one eight four four S. Let's look at the schematic for this chip because I'm pretty sure it has an example circuit that we can kind of look at and figure out what what it's doing. Uh, la, 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 example circuit was that it? Uh, don't think this pe don't think this one has an example circuit. It has a little bit at the top here, typical connection. Um, yeah, so you can see here. Actually, I, th I think the I think the two hundred nine two has a better better example circuit. Yeah, here we go. This has a better example circuit. Uh, so you have VB and VS. So VS is connected directly to the low side output before the inductor. So that's going to be getting the just straight up it's, it's that's like the feedback if you like vs what does it say about vs what does it call vs vs high side floating supply voltage so that's the supply and the oh is it the ground oh is it the and then vb Oh, hang on a minute. No, they both say high voltage supply. So maybe one of them is ground, one of them is like like voltage, right? So, yeah, 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 that's what it is. So the plus plus. Okay. So I think, v yeah, yeah, yeah. So VS on here is the high sides, what it's using is like ground reference. Which is going to be the um, just the output switch wave of the low side FET, right? So that's ground for the high side bootstrap, and then this this is the input voltage, which is going to be like I said, about 15 volts above this. So how do we get 15 volts above that? We have there is a 4.7 ohm resistor there by the looks of it, which then goes to a diode which is facing that way. So I was correct with the diode location, but it is a capacitor in parallel, not in series. So in this case, it's not decoupled with the capacitor directly because we have, yeah, so it's literally the bootstrap it just is just formed of 4.7 ohm in, in this example circuit. Um, but we also have, ah, we have VCC 12 volts above negative rail here as well, which is as a capacitor there. Oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Right, so what it's doing is it's using the 12 volt supply here, I think. VCC 12 volts. Is that what that is? Is that a capacitor? Is that, no, that's a different marking. No, no, no is that just a supply? No, that's that's not a capacitor marking, is it? That's just a supply voltage. But it is it is using that though, because look, yeah, we have VCC 12 volts, so it, it is using the 12 volts VCC above negative rail here. Oh no, hang on a minute, that's not a um, sorry. There's not a dot there. I'm getting confused. I thought that this line. I thought that this line here was connected to this 4.7 ohm resistor, but it's not, is it? Because there's no dot there. Right, apologies. Start again. We start again. <laughs> this is the circuit diagram for the 2092. This shows how how bootstrap works on the high side. Okay, so VS. This is the ground reference for the high side tr gate drive for, for the bootstrap, okay? Which is the class D switching wave, the rail to rail switching just before the inductor from the low side output, okay? You can see the low side output is connected there and is also connected to the high side source because that's what it's using as its ground reference. So the high side ground reference is the output class D switch wave. Then we have this capacitor which decouples. So this VB is gonna be the supply voltage for the gate, for the high side gate. So the supply voltage for the high side gate needs to be about 15 volts above the ground reference for high side. So the ground reference is this big switch wave. So we need something about 15 volts above this big switch wave. 
Um, and in order to get that, we have a capacitor here, which decouples by the looks of it, um, the switch wave here, but we'll let some through. We then have 12 volts above negative rail coming through this diode. Okay, so this diode is gonna be blocking current going back this way towards the 12 volts, but it's gonna be letting 12 volts through in a way to VB. But we have this, this capacitor here. So the way that this is gonna pump is it's actually gonna kind of use this 12 volt supply and it's gonna apply this 12 volts above this PWM that's coming in from through this capacitor. And we also have a 33 kilo ohm pull up, probably, um, resistor here, perhaps. Oh, I'm not quite totally sure. And then we have another one here. See, this is the shutdown, so that's, that's nothing to do with that. But yeah, I think that, yeah, that, that, do you look at this circuit, that's how it's working, basically. Hi guys, uh, cool, thanks for joining me. I think we're gonna lock off the stream right about now. Been a fun one, it was a bit impromptu, didn't we really have much planned, but yeah, I hope that's been interesting, hope you had a good time. And uh, yeah, probably the next stream that I do, hopefully will be this, um, this special live stream with Daniel where we try and repair an amplifier remotely from the UK. We try and fix Dan Daniel's amplifier um, in the States. Uh, so jump on that one, hit the bell icon if you want to be notified about when that live stream happens. Until then, I'll see you next time. Have a great weekend. Have a great rest of the evening. See you next time.